Hello everyone, greetings from the Servant of Nero, AJ here, and in a direct follow-up to the summary of the effects of the Cataclysm, this one is about the first of the two historiographical eras within the interceding period prior to the coming of the Orgoth, marked by the rapid expansion of humanity into Western Amaran and early recorded contact among the various races that lived there. Because a great part of this somewhat long stretch of history is broadly considered a bit of an equivalent to the Dark Ages, it is very poorly recorded both in-world and out. Societal and anthropological evolution is stressed to demonstrate and illustrate a dynamic setting in which very little is permanent, even though the events of these more or less three and a half thousand years are essentially irrelevant to war machine and hordes in and of itself. Indeed, uh, mortal upheaval is a running theme of the world, and all the mortal races except dwarves go through numerous upheavals during the times of the Cataclysm up until the modern era. So what follows is another somewhat summative study covering the major events of note that occur from shortly after the Cataclysm up to the establishment of the city-state of Caspia, this time otherwise known as the Warlord Era, largely accepting events in rule as the lands of the dwarves have, since the founding of Gord, long been the anchor of stable civilization in Western and Warren. Because of the lack of artwork, surprise surprise, only even more so for this subject, this video will come off more as a short narrative podcast than anything else. This era in the history of Imaran can be divided into events in the East and those in the West. For the three greatest races of the East and what was once Central Imaran would remain largely independent in their actions from all else, even amongst each other. Meanwhile in the West, the races for whom civilization and culture were novel concepts would look to seek their place in the world and attempt to establish themselves. Thus the West would be subject to the ebb and flow of the ambitions of many a petty lord and their attempts to fulfill said ambitions. Naturally, most would fail, but a handful of notable kings would succeed, and with these failures and successes would be the rise and fall of nations. To address the straightforward aspects first, the three greatest races of the East, Lyosin, Scorn and Giant, who were most apparently affected by the Cataclysm, their primary goal for the untold generations, or just centuries for the Giants, was stability. All three worked towards it with commendable single-mindedness. The Divine Court guided the Lyosin survivors to the forests of the Mispau, and Lyosin became Iosin, Ios, founded as a refugee state more than anything else. But during these times, the elven gods and goddesses aided their people to build a nation that might be worthy of being called home to the Divine, even though the eight capitals of Ios's Ithils would always be a mere shadow of Lyosin magnificence, much less a reflection of the Divine Palace in the Veld. Even so, the elves toiled and survived. To the northeast, the giants retreated to their last city and recovered, looking to themselves, and themselves alone thanks to their much reduced numbers and the disappearance of their Lyosin neighbours. And the scorn transitioned from nomadic to settled, founding their first permanent city of Malfas and successive cities around Lake Myrketh, which, amidst the barren expanses that comprise much of scorn hinterlands, would become the centre of their growing empire. Houses replaced tribes, new technologies accelerated their settlement as a race, and new traditions built upon the old in what would become a common refrain of furthering the scorn race and honouring their exalted ancestors. These three races kept themselves during these times, whether it is their council or their resources, sharing little by way of trade or diplomatic relations with outsiders, both close and distant. West of the lately formed Bloodstone Desert, the races of Western Morin did not remain idle, and the centuries ahead of them after the time of the burning sky would be one of change, expansion and conflict, all in equal and equally great measure, for many of the names from these times, whether of peoples or of places, would not survive to the modern era except as words in history books and enthusiasts' chronicles. Some of the initial followers of the sage priest Geth during the first exodus from ancient Ichthya at least those that survived, failed in their quest to spread civilization to the lands in the north, and, whether resentful or despondent at this failure, formed scattered tribes in central western Amoran, with only the most adventurous few venturing to brave the beasts and other races that resided in the north and further west. Early on in the Warlord era, the tribes of humans here, having to contend with other peoples and races not friendly to them, coalesced in the area that was then known as the Valley of the Maud. The strongest among them rose to be princelings amongst the various villages, and to better secure themselves and their power, they formed at first a loose confederation and then a more unified kingdom of sorts, resistant to outsiders, but barely tolerant of each other. Characterised by a sense of selfishness and maintaining their rule by any means and at any cost, the chiefs of the Maud resorted to the dark and occult arcane to keep their power. 
They had no qualms about this, having lost their belief in the Mennonite ways and the old faith dozens of generations before, and suffering greatly in attacks from the Mulga. And in later centuries, the Maud would have aid from an even darker source, in the eyes of the rest of the civilised humanity at least. Though it is not known at what time he did so, the dragon Everblight took an interest in the Mordic realms, and some time after its unification, he made agreements with the ruling lords to lend them his power, giving rise to their command of his early dragonspawn in their campaigns of conquest. Thanks in part to this meddling by Everblight, which would last well over a thousand years, the Mulga, as well as other surrounding powers, could not contend with the empowered Maud. These aforementioned Mulga would prey upon those fleeing the privations caused by the time of the burning sky, thus allowing to them to come to some eminence at much the same time as the Maud. Consequently, expansion by the Mennonites from the south was, during the early generations, slow. Competing tribes of Tolkien, Ogren, and other humans whose ancestors had forsaken the Creator delighted in sacrificing unfortunate victims to the Devourer Worm during their raids. Such was their frenzied attachment to such worship, they would even offer blood sacrifices from rival Mulgo tribes. In the face of such unprovoked violence, the Mennonites eventually banded together under the warrior priest Valent Thrace. Under his leadership, they built the great fortress city of Calacia. Behind its towering walls, the Mennonites could sleep safely for once and carry out their livelihoods without fear. Technology advanced in these times too, as metalworking developed with primitive but improving methods to steel crafting, shown in the superiority of their weapons and armour when the Galatians clashed with the more simply armed Mulga transgressors. Their efforts supplemented by attendant priests and their prayers of support that immolated the enemy thanks to fiery miracles. Winning small victories where they could, civilised humanity expanded bit by bit, though the conflict between Mennonite Kalashian and Devour cultist Mulga would continue unabated for several centuries. Only distance saved the Kalashians from conflict with the Maud as well as the Mulga. Matters came to a head in what would mark the beginning of the end of the Warlord era. Priest King Golovant and his followers tired of the unceasing struggle against the Mulga and brought the fight to them directly foraying further west than any of his predecessors, burning villages of the Mulga where and when they found them. To counter this, the Mulga banded together under the leadership of the charismatic Cholkin, Horfar Grimir, who led the cultists on a bloody counter-attack, bent on levelling Kalatia to the ground. Eventually, the two sides fought each other under the shadow of the Shield of Thrace, the great network of walls that protected the fortress city. After a long battle during which Human and Cholkin faced each other personally several times, the priest king emerged victorious and Grimir was subdued and executed. Golovant pursued the scattered remnants of the Mulga west and ruthlessly drove them out of the Wild Wall Mountains and surrounding areas. With this defeat, the Mulga confederation fell apart and any sense of organisation among the disparate races and their tribes disintegrated. But their traditions would live on, even if most of the Dunian races would return to her worship. This left behind the barbaric humans who, thanks to generations of occult rites, shamanic rituals and druidic potions, gave rise to a race of people who were half human and half beast. Despite the fall of the Mulga, these people, soon to be called Tharn, held fast to their beliefs in the Devourer Worm, and became some of the first servants of the newly formed Circle Lorbros, who quickly came to realise the value of subversion and secrecy, but still required the Worm's worshippers to thrive within a world increasingly hostile of their seemingly unnecessary barbarism. Under the blacklads of the Circle Lorbros, worship of the Worm would continue in strength and restore the balance among the primal and the divine that was their goal. This would be the time when the magical link between man and beast would be finally understood and given a name, the Wilding, a curse among the civilised, but a blessing among those closer to the natural world. But the ambition of the Mennonite priest kings did not end at the establishment of such grand nations as Calatia in the south and at the feet of the Mulga there. Looking to his own destiny, the priest king Kardavik unified the territories and the peoples of the north, forming the Kardic Empire in his drive to expel the remnants of the Mulga and their worm-worshipping allies and confederates. Unlike their southern counterparts who formed the Mordic Confederation, those acolytes of Geth who braved the northern lands to spread the word of the lawgiver were heeded by the barbarian horse lords they found there, and the old faith took root. The faith of those who would become northern Mennonites was different from those in the south, however, infused with local beliefs that many considered, and still consider, to be heretical, argued because belief in Minoth came about from fear rather than true faith. Nevertheless, Karavik would rise as the greatest of the warlords here, and certainly the most ambitious and most zealous. 
With a similar violence and efficiency to his peers in the south, Kardovic cleansed his realm of those that did not follow Menoth. Throughout these campaigns, first in the south by Golvant and his successors, and then in the north by Kardovic and his successors, the Dunian races were put to the sword, seen as irreconcilable followers of the worm, just as many thousands of barbarian humans were permitted to convert to Menoth. In these years, while the populations of Trolkin, Ogren, and Goblin, and others diminished, most that remained returned to Dunia's embrace and her worship. Among Trolkin chroniclers, this has been called the Dunian Awakening, a consequence of which was the awareness of the bond by blood of the troll species, confirmed by early Trolkin shamans. As the Menites consolidated their hold throughout the lands of the western Imeris mainland, the dragons, scattered amongst them, sought to exert themselves on the migrating residents. But where Everblight was cunning and cooperated, his brothers were not so calculating. Few incidences are recorded, but none were so productive, as it were, as Everblight's interactions. The island of Thelborn was raised and its tribes wiped out because of a petty offence. While the Kossite king Javosk fought Halfalg to a stalemate, the king losing many including from his own family, but boasted being able to witness a dragon flee in retreat. Conversely, though better equipped than the humans to face the dragons, the giants would have worse luck than a mere draw, for they would defeat one dragon only to face the twins its defeat created. But during these generations, while mankind expanded throughout the West at the expense of other races who in turn sought to recover, yet long before they defeated the dragon Erdros, the giants, and with them the Iosans, discovered within themselves what would prove to be incurable ailments of their very people. Like the giants, the Liosans were as much immortal before the cataclysm, but soon after they found themselves living to only a few hundred years before suffering the effects of age. Thanks to the withering of the divine court's power, wasted away to protect themselves and to preserve what remained of their people during and after the cataclysm, their connection to the elves was grievously weakened. As a race bound in inextricably to their gods, the Liosans, and then their successors, the Iosans, would inevitably be affected by this weakening, and it manifested itself in mortality and disease. This affected the giants also, but they would retain their effective immortality, for their god, Mon Loeth, was and is a much different entity. Even so, the tremendous energies released from the cataclysm and their proximity to the abyss caused the giants' bloodlines to weaken. Whether it is this, or their struggles against dragonkind and how the blight affects them, none but the giants themselves can confirm. Yet with but a single exception, they are unwilling to speak with or listen to outsiders. No matter the cause, for a race that already has an exceedingly low birth rate, female children among the giants are tragically rare, and with such a low population already, they are gradually dying out even if it is agonising millennium by agonising millennium. The last great turning point of this era was the aftermath of Golovant's rule in Galatia. His successors had grown petty after his death, dividing Galatia into competing fiefdoms which were reunited under the priest king's grandson, who renamed the city Caspia. A true turning point, for this name would survive. The time that followed would be called the Era of the Thousand Cities, now that civilization was on the rise in Western Warren, replacing the barbarian tribes and petty nations of before. Though whether this would presage a time of prosperity for the continent's peoples, or further hardships and upheaval, remained to be seen.